It's a network of schools and libraries and businesses and other institutions eager to collaborate in fostering human progress that fits on a finite planet, you know, that's durable. And we're doing lots of networking these days, I, and I keep circling back to Match.com as sort of the example. Uh, we need a Match.com for, for innovation, for, and not just for innovation, again, not just for widgets, but for, you'll see what I mean in a second. And there are, there are experiments underway. Scientists Without Borders, it's through nyas.org, the New York Academy of Sciences. Has, it's basically a problem-solving thing. Hey, I've got a problem with a water pump uh, system in Botswana, and I need someone to make it more efficient. Um, there's um, Innocentive, which is also, which is kind of a commercial enterprise to foster invention that can pay off. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know. And uh, there's Global Giving, which is about finding the, your favorite uh, charity, essentially, that's focused on ending poverty or you know sustainability. But what there, are, what I haven't seen yet is sort of a, the equivalent for um, a set of challenges that occur when you're trying to convey or, or uh, improve conditions in, in different realms, and that's where schools can come in. They form the hub for communication and, and expression for creating health. They are, I mean, we, this is stuff that schools already do. They're places where people come to learn, to express themselves, to learn how to express themselves, to create healthy, resilient environments, like you're doing with your campus here, the climate commitment, to, um, you know, you're the future, you are the future, whether you want to be or not, you are, <laughs> for better or worse, you're James Dean, um, or not. Uh, and so this is the traditional kind of network shape and this is not about this. That's where you have, again, some central authority, like um, the California University system being done through some central authority. There's aspects of this that, that can work, like you know, community organizations can come to campus to do stuff, or ask you questions, or say, hey, I need, I need X, who can help? But one of the other things that schools can do, uh, along with this list I've already articulated, is your place where experimentation and, and learning can experimentation in learning can happen. And one thing I would love to see more, and maybe this happens here at Santa Monica College, is where, where students in education arenas, where you're studying to be a teacher, where you're out working in schools in the neighborhood, but testing out different ways to, to build a culture of innovation. And one thing, my wife, my wife uh, taught science for a long time. She doesn't do, do that right now. But when she was at the school, she and her, uh, one of her teaching uh, teammates came up with this tweak of a sort of a standard learning exercise where kids build bridges out of balsa wood and, and break them. And, and, and this is what it looked like. And did you see the enthusiasm? The kids love to break stuff, first of all. I was just with Nate Lewis, this Caltech uh, scientist, and, at a meeting, uh, he, he spoke uh, via Skype at a meeting in Houston I was kind of working as, a, as the, the moderator at. And, I, and one of the questions from the kids was, how did you get to be you know, what, you want, what you are now, scientists working on energy? He said, oh, I used to love to blow stuff up. So, so you want to harness that innate curiosity and, and energy in kids working collaboratively. These, these are teams that would build these bridges and, and then break them intentionally, and then by piling a successive weight on them, and, and then you, you were graded uh, you know, based on the performance of your design. But, but uh, Lisa and, and, and Mike Topchik, they came up with an interesting spin on this, which is so valuable in, in this complex world. This, the students had a budget. It wasn't real money, but they had to buy their wood from a supply, you know, the Home Depot equivalent in the classroom. And so they were judged, their performance was judged on, on a mix of cost and benefit. So you could have, if you spent all your money and you built a really strong bridge, but it was like ridiculously expensive compared to others, then that, that didn't mean you won necessarily. So the, that's, what a, what a great exercise. These are kids who had to learn how to, how to do something with limits, how to, how to be, think about two realms at the same time and, and also think creatively. One of the things they had to do when the bridge breaks is they had to write a little paper on how, why they think it broke and what they would do differently the next time. So learning by breaking. I, I wrote a piece on Dot Earth maybe a year ago, called uh, breaking, uh, breaking Things on the Path to Learning. And, um, and I think there's a, so much merit in experimenting in that arena, especially because your average teacher in the public school classroom doesn't have any of the time to develop a, you know, a learning module on, that, on, on his or her own. So finding ways to get that out there, I think, is great. Um, 
So the physical school, remember what I li like about this conception of things is you have people intentional working on specific ca campuses, building relationships with businesses and communities around them and demonstrating things like, like I just saw here, the, the garden, the organic garden. Harvey Mudd uh, College, uh, the Center for Environmental Studies there has a region, regional landscaping clinic, again, where they're demonstrating ways to use native plants and, and to have limited water use and that kind of thing. So the more that you can take your gardens and have them on the web, have, have some explainer for what the value is for the different plants and have that out as a resource for the community, I think the, the better off we'll all be. Um, there, there's other things when you think about physical schools in developing countries, you have all the kids coming from very impoverished households to a hub every day. That's a great network for building out just simple things like the importance of washing hands, which is one of the bigger ways to, you don't need antibiotics, you don't need um, sophisticated means to, to limit um, waterborne disease. You just need to know how to wash your hands. And, and that, that kind of thing can be, again, a great way to facilitate uh, learning and, and having it have impact. The other thing that's really too common, a little less so in California, but more even in some states here like Oregon, is schools are not places to go to when something bad is happening. They're places to run away from. Um, Oregon has 1,000 schools that I've written this repeatedly are, are extremely vulnerable or doomed in the next great Northwest Cascadia earthquake. The only reason California has a lower vulnerability is because the, the, the Long Beach earthquake just down the coast, just around, right around here in 1931 or so, uh, prompted the passage of laws that require pretty good standards for schools. But the good news about California is you've got enough low-grade seismic activity that you're always thinking about earthquakes compared to other states. The Northwest, they haven't had a big one in, since uh, the year 1700. So there's not a lot of memory there. So that's why people are a little more lax. So I want to just show you a little quick video that, um, in an animation that shows you how, again, on a limited budget with a, a design, a smart design, in this case, created by a, um, an engineer at Purdue, could go a long way toward making schools and, and struggling places in seismic zones safer. So this is, I, I went to a junior high that looked just like this. It was like, you know, basically a half wall with windows. It's not a good design for an earthquake zone. And as I wrote, there's hundreds, hundreds of millions of kids around the world in, in going to school in, in seismic zones. These are some buildings that pancake, that design pancakes. So you end up with this kind of impact. This was just the other day in Turkey, where a dormitory was among the buildings that collapsed. So there are weak spots there. This. My son created this uh, animation. Now, now take, just remember what you saw there, and then the same materials, all you have to do is reconfigure them. You don't need stronger materials, you don't need different materials. So if you just move the wall, put the structural walls that way, and here was a, this is a, a full-size three-story building tested at the shake table in uh, Purdue, you end up with a fundamentally safer school. And, and it doesn't have to look bad. So he came up with this design. I want that design to be everywhere where people, remember we're in, right now we're in this moment on earth where we're poised in the next 20 or 30 years to build more structures than have ever been built in all of history combined, mostly in, in developing countries, almost, almost all in developing countries. So if you can get ahead of that pulse of construction and make sure that the engineers, there mostly aren't engineers involved in building many of these buildings. So if you, right at the village level, if you could just show people a very simple document, a film loop that doesn't have to even have words. You can say, you know, the bricks move here, safer building. And I think you could go a long way in that arena toward to having safer outcomes. So the networks, this is the network school. So, how, you know, if you're at Purdue University, how do you make sure you get that out there? There's a, there's a group called, or there's a website called Open Architecture Network that's working on that kind of thing to get good designs where they need to be, whether it's energy efficiency or, or earthquake safety. So the cool thing about the web, and, and as you'll see cell phones, is that, that networking, getting ideas, moving around, and, uh, is, is never been more doable. I was just at Iowa State University a couple of days ago. I'm, just, I'm doing like a brief loop around the country. Um, and it, there's an old tradition here of the extension service. It goes back to the 1800s, where the government and land-grant colleges would go out to talk to farmers and show them best practices. And that 
that's the great American tradition. And now with the web, that can be a global extension service. There are many schools that are partnering with schools in developing countries, for example, to show them better, um, you know, more sustainable agriculture practices, that kind of thing. So this is a more, see, this is a better kind of network. This is the kind of network that this all would look like and is like, essentially, it's happening. It just doesn't have a name. Where you have, the nodes are these physical campuses with their engaged communities, and then you have all this crosstalk. And you don't, you know, it looks very abstract, but I'm gonna show you a very specific example of how it's playing out in the real world. There's a, there's a group called AtlanticRising.org um, that I wrote about not long ago. It's a British, it's basically it's like four or five young British uh, communicator educators who um, have taken on the, the task of uh, going to coastal communities around the rim of the Atlantic Ocean and talking about sea level rise, about coastal impacts from climate change. And they're pretty, they're not judgmental, they're not alarmist, they're not, and they're not, certainly not deniers, they're, they're just engaging these uh, students in these communities with the reality of what it would be like to have a three foot sea level rise in, in your coastline. And so they, um, you can see these are some of the places they've been. And these, there are schools that have been partnered up by Skype. So the students in Scotland and Ghana are talking to each other about the, their, their coastal issues related to climate change. And they're learning about their different cultures and their different orientations toward the coast. And I think it's a wonderful example. This is, I, I stumbled on these people out in, in Massachusetts. At a, they were giving a presentation with students there and just showing them at one of the lighthouses there. That's a three foot, you know, that's basically what three feet above the mean high tide would be. And that's something that I think can stick with kids. And just, not, you know, it's not saying, woe is me, go, you know, whatever. It's just making them engage on the question. Now, you, you could easily say, well, you know, it's fine to talk about networking, blah, blah. But there's still two, two billion people on the planet who don't have um, uh, an electric light bulb. And these kids in, Ga in Guinea have to walk from their slum dwellings each night to the airport parking lot to do their homework because there's no electricity at home. And I've put this picture on my website repeatedly as kind of a reminder that the energy challenge is, has two faces. It's not just about which light bulbs we use or driving less. It's about how do we empower, literally, the, the billions on the planet who have access either to no energy in terms of electricity or really dirty cooking fuels, that kind of thing. And the answer to that could very well be a fossil fuel for them. They, the last thing they need is to be thinking, oh, you know, um, zero carbon, that's our job because we have the technology and the wealth. So you can think, well, you know, how are they gonna get on this, uh, your noosphere? And, uh, but that's happening, it's happening amazingly fast. Um, uh, Libby Rosenthal, a colleague, a colleague of mine at the Times, last year, almost about a year ago, went to rural Kenya, and she met a woman who um, uh, had a cell phone, like so many people in even poor countries, poor regions have, but she was tired of having to go into town every week to charge it up at a very high rate per kilowatt hour, per watt minute. And uh, so she saved up enough money to buy a cheapo kind of solar, little solar array to put on the roof of her, her hut. And she started charging her phone. She started, she had excess electricity, so she was set up a little business charging her neighbor's phones. <laughs> and uh, her kids could do homework at home instead of having to, well, in, the, in their case, they had no options. There's no street light to go to. And their, their performance was better in school. And the, uh, and then, by the way, the, this is the cool thing, her neighbors got sort of tuned into this and they started buying their own solar panels. So they put her out of business, but they're all, you know, you can see how that, just think of that as a wave spreading through communities around the world right now. It's, and, and it's such a wave. This is what that wave looks like. 10 years ago on this planet, 11 year, almost 12 years ago, there were only 700 million cell phones and about two thirds were in rich countries. Now there are five billion cell phones and three quarters of them are in poorer countries. Now obviously most of those are in China and India. We know, obviously, there's fewer in Africa, but they're, but they're spreading like wildfire there because the people, there's great value. I don't know if you've heard that you can use a cell phone essentially as a bank. You, you can use it if you're a farmer. There are still many rural places in Africa where the farmer now calls in for a crop price so he knows which, uh, merch, you know, which town to go to to sell his, his grain or whatever. It's, it's changing the world. And it's a short trip from where we are right now to those kids having access by phone to a, a course here at Santa Monica College. 
or some equivalent. And you know, they're not smartphones now, but they will be. And there still is a big digital divide, but you'll see in a few minutes where the internet is getting out there really fast. I'm sure many of you have seen this in many places. So I had my little sort of wake up call on that when I went to Istanbul in 2009 to write a, a big story for the Times on the next inevitable earthquake there. And anyone who doubts that Istanbul is gonna get hammered by a really devastating quake that will make the, what you saw the other day in Eastern, in Eastern Turkey look mild, you just look at the history of the art. There's, a, there's an art collector in the Czech Republic who has this whole like a millennium's worth of art on earthquakes. And this is from 1509. This is a, a woodcut of what Istanbul looked like after an earthquake in 1509. There's, there's all kinds of art from then on charting the various big shocks that have occurred there. There just hasn't been one recently. And so what happened in Istanbul, you have a city that was about 1 million people 50 years ago. Now it's 15 million people in that metropolitan region and there hasn't been an earthquake in that time, and it's coming. So I went there to write a story uh, about what people like this kid, or you know, what's, what's, what's being done to bolster schools there, to re retrofit schools, um, to build new, new ones more safely. But while I was doing that, I kind of I went around to a lot of neighborhoods. This was me at one of the, one of the retrofitted schools. And you know, whenever you're a reporter from some quirky place and you come into a community, you've got your pad and your camera or whatever, kids are, you're like a kid magnet. They all come running up to you. Now, usually they're like, you know, just saying hello or trying out some word in, in, in English. And here they were saying, Facebook? <laughs> L literally, that was like the first word out of several kids' mouths. And I was like, what are you talking about? And so, and this was in, I was in a slum area when this happened to me first. And none of these kids on computers, but they did have, they had a community center where they could go and, and work on computers or play on computers. <laughs> And they're mostly playing games. Wow. But not all. And uh, some of them were um, on Facebook and playing Farmville. And I, so this, my, my sort of semi-epiphany was these kids are playing Farmville. My kid back home in Garrison is playing Farmville. I'm sure by now some of them are playing Minecraft, which is his current obsession, my 13-year-old. And uh, so you, you have the, you're poised to have the whole world playing together. And it's, a, again, a short jump from playing together to working together, to getting more familiar with each other, more comfortable with the global community. And, and Google and others are racing to develop ever more efficient and ever more effective uh, translation interfaces. So it's not that far from now you're going to go on Facebook and have some friends who are not speaking English, but you'll be able to communicate. And by the way, those kids, a bunch of them, the kids from that slum are now my friends on Facebook. <laughs> so if you go to my page, you'll find them. And uh, so I think, again, we're poised for an extraordinary amount of um, exchange. And as, uh, w there's a book I regard very highly called the, the Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley. I don't agree with him on everything, but I do agree with him on that one of the foundations of innovation trajectories for human species has been exchange, exchanging ideas, meeting different people. And, and sort of shaving off or exchanging knowledge on, on things, whether it's a harpoon or uh, how to build a better computer. So when I was a kid their age, you know, my exchange was, was uh, looked like that. It was these, any of you older people ever have a pen pal when you were a kid? You'd send off this blue crinkly airmail letter and then three weeks later you get one back. And I still remember, and, and the power of it is significant. I mean, I remember uh, my pen pal when I was like, in sixth grade was Alfred Iwani from West Cameroon, Africa. And I still remember that, not because I wrote it down intending to remember it, but because it's kind of embedded in my, my you know, deep in me, in my memory. And, you know, maybe the rarity of it made it special and made, it, made me, in, you know, integrate that more into how I thought about the world. But I do think you're gonna see this sort of, I think the potential for, for this power to connect being a positive force is very high. And it, I think it will overwhelm the negative and that's, a, you know, that's an article of faith. I'm just telling you I think that. I don't have a basis for that conclusion. But I do see, again, enough experiments that I think it's true. So schools, getting back to schools. At Pace University, you know, I moved from like 25 plus years of being a reporter to back to academia. I had done some part-time teaching. But I'm, now at Pace, I've got this wacky title that I invented for myself. I'm the Senior Fellow for Environmental Understanding. Because, uh, you know, after just putting out information for decades, I suddenly realized, wow, you know, information doesn't always matter. And if I'm not paying attention to the other end, I better, I'm not really, what am I doing? I'm just wasting time. 
So, so now I'm trying to understand the whole flow and trying to look at, again, things like the web and see how you can make it, make it work better. And I'm working with students at Pace. We have a spring travel course that's existed for about a decade where, where the students, um, on their spring break, with help from the professors, they focus on a place they're going to go for spring break that's both a fun place to go, because you're going to be spending money to go there, but a place where you're going to make a film. And I just joined the course last year, and, and we went to Belize and did a film about a pioneer, this woman, Linda Thornton, who was a pioneer in um, working to make shrimp farming sustainable. You know, shrimp farming has one of the worst environmental and, and uh, labor um, sort of records as a business, and, and we wanted to focus on an example where it was being done right. So these are, and they're not environmental science students, they're not sustainability majors, they're just, they're communication students who wanted to make a cool film about a subject that relates to making the world a better place. And we shot uh, all kinds of cool video, and they made a very effective film. So the film, the film was essentially a collaboration. We ended up with, with interviews done by three different universities. And so think about that. Think about an issue like fracking or an issue water, uh, nuclear power in communities, uh, the impacts of wind farms. Think if you were able to collaborate with schools in different parts of the, of the country or eventually different parts of the world to tell a story that's reported as a community. That's another thing I think is a, a new and powerful possibility. So, and then, uh, you know, we're trying to reach out in other ways. I've, built, I've just created a course that's just uh, inaugurated this fall called Blogging a Better Planet. And it's not because I know that that's even possible. Dot Earth is still an experiment. So why, I don't have a lot to teach these students. I have a lot to explore with these students about how to use Twitter in new ways and to, con to aggregate and, and examine other people's experiments and, and these amazing ways to send ideas around. Our course has a hashtag Pace blog, so if you want to look for some of the conversation, please do so. But there's a professor at uh, University of Connecticut. She's a biologist who teaches a bird behavior course. And every year, she, I got in touch with her. I met her at, at UConn. And she told me that she requires all her students to get a Twitter address. And then one of their assignments through the semester is to tweet when they see bird behavior, which I think is kind of you know, funny <laughs> on, its, on the surface. But what she found was that these students were engaging they were engaging and enthusiastic about observing bird behavior much more because it was, there, there, was a, there was this part of it. <laughs> so they were taking physical analog experience and channeling it into the digital world. And there's ways to do that increasingly, engaging both through those, the, the two sets of neurons or whatever that we're using. And I'm really a big fan of you know, multimodal communication and thought. So uh, WJNet, uh, WJChat is a weekly uh, web journalism chat, which is another place you can, if you search for that hashtag, you'll find some in interesting experiments. So here's a classroom, a crowded classroom with an overloaded teacher. And here's another opportunity for students, particularly in communication and science, to get engaged. I was at a meeting of the, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, early this year. And there was a session on what teachers need, what science teachers need or lack. And one thing they all were craving, it sounded like, was uh, not some big thorough documentary on, on climate or whatever, but a one minute, just an explainer, what's called an explainer, a little introductory video that they can launch into a lecture on a big subject with, just to get the students engaged. And, uh, and there's a, plenty of experiments along these lines underway on campuses. I'm trying to, I can't find out who made this one. Today on Waves of the Future. It's called, a it's on geoengineering. And geoengineering. What is geoengineering? Well, geoengineering is something global, intentional, and unnatural. And we've got some smart fellers figuring out new methods. Let's look at a few. Space mirrors! In this lifelike reenactment, Eric is the sun, and Patrick is the Earth. As Patrick orbits Eric, he receives some of Eric's solar radiation, making Patrick very warm. <laughs> Let's see what Patrick has up his sleeve. By deploying space mirrors, Patrick deflects <laughs> some of Eric's warming radiation, making himself comfortably cool. I earn near the Galapagos. This is a scale model of the ocean. <laughs> what you got there, Patrick? Looks to me like a handful of rusty nuts and bolts. Let's see what happens when you fertilize the ocean with that iron. Algae blooms. They spelled algae wrong. 
But see, that, what you could do is you could, if we had a place where teachers seeking explainers could post a little request, hey, you know, I'm looking for a way to animate um, a little thing on momentum, and students at schools of communication or graphic arts can pop something up there. Maybe faculty or other scientists can critique it. Remember, the web is all about critique. And then it gets redone and posted, and then teachers around the world have this learning tool that didn't exist you know, a day or two earlier. So that's the kind of network that I'm trying to find a way to build. And again, I don't think it's something that requires much building. It just requires exchange uh, and, and, and intent, intent, intentionality. So the other thing about the web, of course, and I talked about multimodal communication, but multimedia, getting at all the neurons in your brain. Yeah, I've got very attuned to my neurons after losing some. Uh, but there's like, this is your brain on words. This is your brain seeing words, hearing words. So look, different part of the brain, uh, thinking about words. And then, of course, speaking words is another. So if you're only sending out text, words, then people are not, they're only part of the brain is working on that. So how, how do we work more effectively or creatively at getting at everything, using every part of communication to make a story come alive? And here's an example from NYU. NYU has this new, uh, through their journalism and communication program, they have a group called, it's explainer.net, which is, as I was saying, just the basics of some issue. And they did one on, um, on fracking. Fracking is a form of natural gas drilling, an alternative to oil, because the oil kept spilling, bringing jobs to small towns, so everybody's willing. People turn on the lights, and the drill is making killing. Water goes into the pipe, the pipe into the crowd. The pressure cranks fish 7,000 feet down. The cracks release the gas that powers the town. That will fracked. Yeah, it's totally fracked. But there's more in the water than just H2O. Toxic chemicals help to make the fluid flow. With names like benzene and formaldehyde, you better keep them far away from the water supply. The drillers say the fishes are a mile below. The groundwater pumped into American homes. But don't tell it to the residents of Sublawayo that water's fracked. The token benzene. So uh, students wrote that, they sang it. It's great. Um, one thing that I thought was particularly noteworthy about that was it, um, it was not judgmental. When you get behind, you get beyond the surfacey, you know, I think when you start listening to it, it sounds like an anti-fracking thing. But it's actually, in the end, it just asks the question, we need more information. And, and that's true. When you go to these communities, anyone who tells you no fracking, you know, we need a permanent ban, is not really being realistic to the energy demands that we have in this country and around the world. And so you, you know, you, it's about trade-offs. It's about get, finding better sources of information, making sure industry is not cheating or hiding something. But getting people engaged is the first step. And this has gotten a couple hundred thousand views on, on YouTube and, and Vimeo. It's a very successful tool. And it was student generated. And it's filling a gap. The New York Times isn't going to make that. I mean, I try on my youtube.com slash Revkin channel to do stuff, but it's not anywhere near as sophisticated as what you just saw. And um, great opportunity. And again, it says something about the arts being involved, which I think is, uh, again, another untapped potential. Um, and everyone's working on that. There was this very successful video a couple of years ago about the climate gate that kind of used the same toolkit to, to, to attack credibility of climate change. So. I'm not, again, saying this is a no-brainer, a win for sustainability automatically, but I do think that the, the, uh, the power of this positive side, I think, can, be, can dominate and swamp the other stuff. And there's been equally unproductive videos um, on the alarmist side. Uh, there was a, this, I think I disagree with Randy on this one. There was a um, British group that put out a video where these students are all talking about climate change and the teacher, as they're leaving the room, the teacher, um, says, so now do you all believe this is a big problem? Essentially, and a couple of students kind of raise their hand like they're not sure, and then she blows them up. Like, total blood spatter effect, like out of walking, The Walking Dead, you know, just boom. And it didn't strike me as productive. So again, experiments can go in different directions, but experimentation is, is vital. So showing and telling, you know, um, you can say the volume of the atmosphere at sea level pressure is x million cubic kilometers, or you can show that. And, and Adam Neiman is a very creative um, science illustrator in um, 
England who took the volume of the atmosphere at sea level pressure and showed you what that would look like as a ball, as a, as a spherical volume. So, you know, if you're going to start some conversation about climate change, I would start with this and then I would start with that little architecture of what we mean about these different words and then you could actually have some constructive discourse. And another, here's another example. If all the world's liquid water was shown as a spherical volume, how big would it be compared to the planet? Would it be big enough to obscure, obscure the United States, big enough to obscure South America or the Northeast or Texas or California? You know, it, the oceans are vast. I was lucky enough when I was younger uh, to sail across two oceans. And when you're in the middle of them, they're infinite and two miles deep and blah, blah, blah. It turns out they're actually really not that big. That, that's all the world's liquid water on the left. Now, yeah, and it gets your attention. And it's not judgmental. It's not saying, woe is me or, or hooray for us. <laughs> it's just a fact. And then you can say, well, how much of that is fresh water? How much of that is potable water? And by, you know, it's not even visible. And then you can start to have a discussion about water. And I think you're in a better place to go forward meaningfully. Now, you know, I talked about the new sphere having its origins with these two, the Frenchman and the Russian, but it actually really goes back to Darwin. When he, uh, in The Descent of Man, he wrote, as man advances in civilization and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all the members of the same nation. Though personally unknown to him, this being, point being once reached, there's only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and all races. Now, there's lots of counterpoint. You know, we are very tribal. We are always in the here and now more than the somewhere and someday. And, but I do think, again, through these amazing technologies and intentionality, we can move toward having a truly global discussion that can foster progress on a finite planet. I do think it's... Um, never been more possible than it is now. And you're incredibly lucky to be young people at this juncture in history, because you're gonna ride this wave wherever it's going, but you actually have the potential like no one had before you to make a difference, and not just locally, but globally. So, and I do try to remember, to remind people that this is um, essentially a small planet. And this is a button that gets, has been pushed before by Carl Sagan, one of the spacecraft leaving the solar system uh, two decades ago, took this picture of Earth from the farthest vantage point leaving the solar system. It's that little dot there. It's not even a full pixel, I think. And it says, you know, I think making sure we remind ourselves once in a while that we're not just in the here and now. We are, we are on this tiny speck. And, and what seems consequential about, you know, what you're going to have for dinner has to be put sometimes, not every day, not all, to, all day, but in, in a broader context and history. So that's where we are. That's, this is where I am. So I'm really easy to find. And um, I encourage you to seek me out and to continue this conversation uh, into the future. So thank you very much. And I assume whoever can, there's probably time for some questions. So any, yeah, any questions? Yell out or something. Yeah. Um, is it reasonable to assume that sustainability, global sustainability, I'll repeat the questions too, yeah. However defined, can be achieved without substantial sacrifices on the part of the world's affluent? And is there any evidence to suggest that the affluent are willing to make those sacrifices? The question was about. Uh, can you get there from here if the rich, if, if those of us in rich nations just keep on keeping on, the, the, the Black Friday, et cetera? Um, there is, uh, whether it's willingness or not, there is a trend that's been measured in a number of arenas toward, you hear about peak resources all the time, peak oil, whatever, but there is peak travel, actually. Lee Shipper, who just passed away, unfortunately, up at Berkeley, his last couple of papers were on charting in, in a number of countries, and this is not related to you know, concerns about greenhouse gas emissions from airplanes or something. You just, you get to a point where you don't keep traveling more and more and more. In other words, more people, more wealth doesn't always lead to more stuff. And obviously I think more engagement at an early age with the understanding of connections between our expenditures and investments, whether they're to buy a TV or, or whatever, um, can lead you to different patterns and, and, and 
in expectations and wants as you grow older. And now whether the question of whether you can get to a, have a smooth trajectory without a lot more of that, I, I think we do need a lot more of that. But I think we're kind of, as I said, we're poised to have more of that. Because um, while China and India are going through this sort of hyper velocity trajectory toward consumptive, consumptive patterns, it's also hyper velocity, which means that there's a chance of having the learning curve be quicker and, and result in a new trajectory down the line. And, and there, my, my, my picture in my mind of what we're going through is that there will be, well, obviously there's gonna be losses. There's, biodiversity has got less space. Um, the chances of significant and unpleasant climate change are pretty high. Um, and, but I do think that there's, we're in this transition. Basically, we have to kind of ride out this peak, this pulse, this crest of this wave. And then a century from now, I think people they'll be looking back as if a wave washed over a beach and now you're sort of settling into a new and more mature pattern. I, I th but I'm not, so I'm not saying that there won't be a big surus between now and then. Um, I do think that we're, there is hope for having this all play out in a pretty good way in the long haul. Um, over, over there. No, no. One goes from I've just got the kids and, and you know, first, uh, oh, I forget the uh, media, first uh, telephone line from Jeffrey Dead, you know, through Moscow in South Central. So it's not automatic. You've got to facilitate people yeah. understanding how you relate and live with somebody. And so the few stress, the question is about sacrifices. We imagine sacrifice as losing, but sacrifice can be totally. Good. That there's a kind of laissez there. this will be okay. And so I want to push back again. We don't even assume we'll make it to 9 billion. I kind of, I agree with people like Paul Gilding, that yeah. the responsibility on and the great destruction of this world. We got a lot to do to even sustain what we have now. So comment on that in my pushing back a little bit. It's not automatic. No, no, it's not automatic, but again, it won't be enforced. It can't be enforced. So it has to build from, I, I think, the idea that we're going to, I'll just take climate as a. Well, well, this kind of enforcement issue, if we're really self governing, if we're really yeah. exceptional, rational species, what turns on that self government <clears throat> and self discipline that's created? It, well, it's a recognition that there's some things that that we can't as individuals. We, pure, utter libertarianism to the extent of every individual always having the right to do anything he or she wants always butts up against lim limits that people see as reasonable and important. And th that's where society, that's where you move from psychology to sociology. You move from what we know about the weaknesses of the human individual to what we know about how we've learned as a species to do constructive, collaborative treaty, treaty making for all, its, for all of its limits. The UN, for all of its ridiculousness, our, our institutions that we've created, and of course laws, in you know, our domestic laws, and work. And we, we can see that articulating the benefits is, is what we can work on better to, to, to make it all seem like an imperative. And I just, I'm trying to write a piece right now. I was on a panel a week ago, two week, well, several weeks ago, with um, the, one of the heads at uh, Health and Human Services and, and the Deputy Administrator of the EPA. And we were talking about how do you make the, ben the, the benefits of public health initiatives like um, secondhand smoke, like um, reducing invisible pollution from power plants, the small particles that aren't the stuff you see? How do you, how do you make sure that people understand the value of having that air cleaner, the value in terms of health outcomes? And I think there, I would like to see, as I wrote on the blog uh, not long ago, I'd like to see someone come up with a way to visualize what, what the, the saved money and saved lives from or, or extended lives from uh, small particle pollution. Uh, because as, as we, uh, um, the EPA guy said, you know, he, at hearings he's badgered by the other side saying, well, where are the bodies, essentially? But, and, and it's only in the statistics that you can really see the benefits of these kinds of programs. And, and, but so I think there's ways to visualize that, to, to, to convey it in a way that's quantitative, inarguable, um, but more effective at reaching 
through our systems. And that can start to build um, some progress. Um, you know, on the, on the bigger point of enoughness, if that's a values issue that comes so much from family and how you grow up that I think just getting kids out in, in nature, whether it's in a city, some little green patch in a city, or whether it's in, in a wilderness, things like that, working on making kids understand they can actually have, have a role in innovation and it's not just in, I mean, policy innovation is, is innovation too. As, as I said, with healthcare outcomes, you could look at environmental issues the same way I was looking at stroke the stroke issue. Um, there are no-brainers out there. So find your way to push forward on that. And I think we could get things moving in the right direction. In, in, in not, you know, it won't be in time to make the world a perfect place, but the world is, a, we're, we're tra we've transformed the world in so many ways that we now see as unremarkable that at, at some time or other we're considered stunning, horrible things or whatever, um, or transitions from something that was stunningly horrible that we thought would always be around, like all the manure in New York City, to cars in that time getting rid of the manure problem and now cars have created their problem and and so then you deal with that problem maybe one more is there one more crying out to be asked Well, the, the yeah, well, it's happening, but again, it's happening. Uh, Transparency International is a really interesting place to go to explore how, uh, again, worldwide, there's efforts underway to, to, to make transparent the, the opaque, whether it's about subsidies, whether it's about impacts from industry, um, to, to, to just sort of infuse. It's, it's going to be a lot harder to be a bad actor and not have that be revealed through everything you can see around you on the internet and through Again, cell phone con connectivity, people can report on bad practices. It, the information can get out in ways that, that was never possible before. And, and in developing countries too, uh, not so much with climate, because, but with other issues in China. You know, China's big pollution initiatives are largely because communities have been really pissed off. And China, after that earthquake that I wrote about in 2008 that killed several tens of thousands of school children and teachers, uh, China got very active about, you know, this can't happen anymore. And so, so I think it's happening. I, I, I'm not so concerned that, with that. And corporations, the global corporations, are, there are initiatives underway to think about best practices and to make sure if you have a best practice at your DuPont plant in Delaware that it's the same one you have in Delhi. If you look at that pattern over time, the recent decades, it's actually most places where the DuPonts of the world go, they raise the standard by being there. The, the local factory, the macchiadora, whatever, are doing worse. So, so I, I, I see good trajectories here, too. And I guess that's about it. Again, Revkin at Gmail. And I'm here, you know. Thank you again.